Easter Sunday because uh, we remember the great work that was done on the cross and the empty tomb uh, that Christ is risen. So he is risen. He is risen indeed. Yes. And uh, this, so this morning, of course, um, we're coming to God and we come to him every time with hearts of thanksgiving and gratitude and worship. Um, but in a special way, God's people all around the world gather and worship and remember on Easter Sunday uh, the greatest thing that's ever happened to human history, which is that Christ came, that he died, and then of course he rose again, proving that what he did was effective and uh, covers our sins completely. And so this morning we'll worship him in that way, and uh, as we come to the, to the music, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to sing a song, then we're going to have a scripture reading, and then we'll sing some more and get into the, the message a little bit later, of course. Before we do all of that, I want to just give you a few announcements as we get started. Uh, first of all, because of Easter Sunday and Monday, Sunday night Bible studies and then Monday night ladies study and the girls group on Monday is going to be canceled for Easter. Uh, so tonight, no Bible study. Tomorrow, no Bible study or girls group. And then we'll pick up again the very next week. Uh, secondly, uh, there's a mom's night out being hosted by Carrie and Mano. And that's coming up Saturday, April the 15th at uh, 7 p.m. at Mano's house. And so if you want to be part of that, um, just let Carrie and Mano uh, know about it. Uh, if you don't know where they live, just, you know, talk to one of them or talk to me and I can give you the details of where they live to get there. And they said, you know, just bring a dessert or a snack that, you, that you'd like and you're more than welcome to come. And they're just going to have some games and fellowship time together. So that's Mom's Night Out on Saturday, April the 15th, 7 o'clock. Uh, and then thirdly, I want to just make the men, uh, remind the men, of course, of the men's retreat, which is coming up the end of June. At the end of June, we like to go on our men's retreat up to NBC, and it's just a great time to be able to get together, uh, enjoy friendship, fellowship. Uh, we're in God's Word and worshiping, of course, throughout the weekend, and there's just uh, a lot of stuff to do. And if you like to fish, or if you like to play volleyball, or like to swim, or like to play football, or tennis, or basketball, or frisbee golf, or any of those kinds of things, or if you just like to sit down and do nothing for the weekend, you're more than welcome to do that as well. Come with us on retreat. The main point, of course, is to get to know one another and to be able to be in God's Word together. So if you'd be able to sign up for that, the sign-up sheet's in the front hallway. It's $210 for the two nights with all of our meals included over the weekend. All right, and then just one last thing. If you're a visitor with us this morning, we have nursery and junior church. Nursery for our infants and preschoolers, uh, available right now out in the, out in the uh, back hallway here. And then junior church will come up just a little bit later, right before the message. We'll dismiss everyone, uh, or the kids, I should say, not everyone, but we'll dismiss the kids for junior church, uh, which is uh, kindergarten up to grade three. So this morning, let's go to God in prayer as we commit this time to him. So if you're able, please stand together, and we'll open up our worship service by going to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, it's with grateful hearts that we come before you this morning, thanking you for your goodness towards us um, and the many blessings that you pour out upon our lives. Lord, there, there are so many things, we couldn't count them all, but Father, we, we thank you for sunshine, we thank you for a warm place to meet uh, and worship together with your people, we thank you for friendship, uh, we thank you for the enduring grace that you give us each and every day to love you and to serve you and to have opportunity, Lord, uh, to meet needs in other people's lives. And Father, we pray that this morning, though, we would help to, you would help us to recognize and see the greatest blessing and gift that you gave to us, which was your son, Jesus. Help us to be able to worship you this morning, Lord, with a heart that is completely centered and focused on what you did for us as you as you sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, and then today we celebrate uh, his resurrection. Thank you, Lord, for overcoming the grave, for overcoming sin and death and its consequences, and for giving us that promise that we too will overcome sin and death uh, when we see Christ face to face. And so, Lord, we look forward to that day, but we thank you this morning for the wonderful gift of the cross and, of course, for the resurrection, the empty tomb. And we pray now that you would be pleased with our worship, for it's in the name of Jesus we pray these things. Amen. I know he rescued my soul. 
His blood has covered my sin. I believe. I believe. My shame is taken away. My pain is sealed in its name. I believe. I believe. I'll raise a banner. Comfort the grave, my Redeemer lives, my Redeemer lives, my Redeemer lives, my Redeemer lives. I know He rescued my soul, His blood has covered my sin, I believe. My shame is taken away, and my pain is sealed in His name. I believe, I believe, I'll raise a banner, because my Lord has conquered the grave, my Redeemer lives, my Redeemer with you I'm dancing on this mountain top to see your kingdom come my redeemer lives my redeemer lives my redeemer lives my redeemer lives my redeemer my Redeemer lives, my Redeemer lives, my Redeemer lives. Well, this morning I'm going to read for you from Matthew chapter 28. This is directly after Christ has been crucified, laid in the tomb, and now it's um, but now it's directly after the Sabbath. It's Sunday, and the ladies are going to the tomb. It says in Matthew 28, verses 1 through 10. Now after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb and went with fear and great joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings, and they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go, tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. We're going to continue our worship this morning with a couple songs that just talk about that gift of salvation through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. We're going to sing, Christ is risen. And then come behold the wondrous mystery. Let's lift these songs up as a praise to our Lord this morning. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah! Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah! Christ is risen from the grave. The 
prodigal is welcomed home, the singer now a saint. For the God who died came back to life, and everything has changed. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? The mighty King of Peace has disarmed you, delivered and redeemed. Eternal life is ours. Oh, praise His name forever. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Our song will be the same. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. And on the day you called me in to heaven's sweet embrace. I'll see your scars, your open eyes, the beauty of your face. To tears of joy, I'll lift my voice in everlasting praise. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? song will be the same. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Jesus is alive. Whoa. And all throughout eternity, our song will be the same. Hallelujah, Christ is risen from the grave. And on the day you call me in to heaven's sweet embrace, I'll see your scars, your open arms, the beauty of your face. Through tears of joy, I'll lift my voice in everlasting praise. Hallelujah, Christ is risen from the grave. Miss 
mystery, he the perfect son of man, in his living, in his suffering, never trace nor stain of sin, see the true and better Adam come to save the hellbound man, Christ the great fulfillment of the law in him we stand come behold the wondrous mystery Christ the Lord upon the tree in the stead of ruined sin the Lamb in victory. See the price of our redemption. See the Father's plan unfold, bringing many sons to glory. Grace unmeasured, love untold. Come behold the wondrous mystery, slain by death, the God of life. But no grave could e'er restrain him. Praise the Lord, he is alive. What a foretaste of deliverance, how unwavering our hope. In power resurrected, as we will be when He comes. What a foretaste of deliverance! How unwavering our hope. Christ in power resurrected, as we will. seated we'll have our kids video at this time God first gave the Israelites his law through Moses so that they could understand that God is holy the law showed that people are sinners the law could not save the people but it was like a shadow hinting at something greater under the law, the people offered sacrifices for their sins, but they were still guilty. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Jesus came to be the ultimate sacrifice for sin. He came to do God's plan, ending the old way of sacrifices by offering himself as the perfect sacrifice once and for all. Under the law, the priests stood day after day offering the same sacrifices, but those sacrifices never took away sins. But Jesus came to offer himself one time. Then he sat down at the right hand of God. With one sacrifice, Jesus takes away the sin of everyone who trusts in him. The Lord said, I will never again remember their sins and the wrong things they have done. Because God forgives our sin, we no longer need to make a sacrifice to pay for sins. Because all of this is true, God calls us to live in a way that honors Him. He invites us to come to Him with boldness and without fear. Jesus' blood has made the way for us to have hearts that are clean and without guilt. Jesus makes us pure when we have faith in Him. He gives us hope and we can tell the whole world about it. We can trust Him to do all that He has promised. We can help one another do what is right by loving others and doing good works. We can meet together and encourage one another because one day, Jesus will come again. Jesus came to be the sacrifice for sin. He lived a sinless life, died on the cross, and rose from the dead. In him, we have complete forgiveness once and for all.
All right, our kids can be dismissed for junior church. And as they're going out, so we're going to get into the Word of God this morning. Before we do, why don't we just bow in a word of prayer and we'll commit this time to the Lord. Father in heaven, Lord, we want to come before you this morning and just ask your wisdom and your understanding from your word. We thank you for the cross and we thank you for the resurrection. And Father, help us understand its meaning, its purpose, and the result and response in our lives uh, that you're calling us to in light of your resurrection. And so, Lord, we thank you that you've given us these truths. You've given us these things that we can freely study and understand and turn to you in worship this morning. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles up to 1 Peter chapter 1 this morning. This is a bit of a continuation From our Good Friday message, we looked at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 on Friday morning, and now I want to finish the thought in that passage of 1 Peter because he begins, of course, by talking about the precious blood of Christ, the lamb without blemish that was sacrificed on our behalf. Then he's going to go on to talk about the resurrection. Now, Christ didn't obviously remain dead. He didn't remain in the tomb. He rose from the grave, and that's what we celebrate Today on Easter Sunday. So in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 to 23, we're going to talk about the resurrection this morning. Before I do, though, one thing that I notice, it seems like in our world today, and maybe you can relate to this in a very real and visceral way, our world seems to be driven very much by fear. I want you to think about that thought. That our world today seems to be driven by fear. Now, what is fear exactly? Well, fear is an emotion, but it's an emotion that's caused by the belief that something or someone is a threat and will cause some kind of pain or discomfort of some kind. Now, think about how there's a bear directly in front of you or in your camp if you're out in the woods. That bear is going to cause some kind of potential threat to your life, maybe, or to your goods. And so there's a natural emotional response of fear. That fear isn't necessarily a bad thing, of course. It's a response to a threat that's right in front of you. And you can see that threat. And you can really even feel that threat. So there's good kinds of fear. But then there's also bad kinds of fear. There's what we might call like irrational fear. Like if I said to you, a meteor could crash into Waterford at any moment, destroying all of us. You might say, well, yeah, okay, that's possible. It's possible statistically possible, I guess some anomaly could happen, but it would be irrational for you to actually fear that, to emotionally fear the thought of an asteroid coming in, or meteor coming and destroying us. So that kind of fear would be like an irrational fear, and maybe you can think of all different kinds of irrational fears out there, and also some legitimate fears out there, but all of them have something in common. The commonality between all fears is that there's a threat. There is some kind of threat. There's some kind of real threat staring you down. I think our world is driven by at least three primal fears. Let me list them for you. Fear of rejection, fear of insignificance, and fear of death. Think about how that relates to you this morning. But I think about the different fears that you might have in your life, maybe even presently, like right now, something that you might fear. I can almost guarantee you that that fear somehow trickles down or flows into at least one of those categories, if not more. Fear of rejection, fear of insignificance, and fear of death. You know, ultimately those fears, they reveal to us something that our heart desires and wants. Fear of rejection, to put it positively, is the desire to be accepted. Fear of insignificance, to put it positively, is the desire to have real, meaningful, significant life. And then fear of death, to put it positively. The human heart and soul has this intrinsic desire that it wants to persevere and endure even past physical death. So in one way or another, I think our world is driven by 
one or more or all of these fears. Fear of rejection, fear of insignificance, and fear of death. And unfortunately, the world goes about in all sorts of different ways trying to answer these fears in all sorts of unhealthy and God-denying ways. Well, this is why Easter is so important. Easter has an answer for each one of these fears in the good news of Jesus' resurrection. So my aim this morning is this, to demonstrate here in the Word of God through 1 Peter that the resurrection that God has provided through Jesus is the best remedy for fear. Because the resurrection of Jesus remedies the threat that causes the fear. Let me say that again. The resurrection of Jesus remedies the threat that causes fear. The threat of rejection, the threat of insignificance, and the threat of death. So in your Bibles, 1 Peter chapter 1, we're going to read verses 20 through 23. You can follow on the screen above too if you don't have your Bible with you this morning. The Word of God says this. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, Love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. The resurrection overcomes the threat that causes fear. First of all, the resurrection overcomes the threat of rejection. And Maybe in your own life, you can relate to this in a very real way by this fear of rejection from people around you. But there's another kind of fear, an even greater kind of fear of rejection that ought to come to mind as well. The fear of rejection, rejection from God. What if God rejected me? What if when I meet him one day face to face, what if he rejects me? Fear of rejection is ultimately born out of the threat that I might be rejected and the desire that I want to be accepted, the threat that God might reject me and the desire that he would accept me. Well, the resurrection has an answer for this fear, of course, and it eliminates the threat of resurrection because it says in verse 20 that Jesus was made manifest In the last times, the last times being the days in which we live, the days in which he came to earth 2,000 years ago, and even the days like today. The last times, when the Bible talks about the last times, it means the last times when God is bringing his salvation to people. And that began with the coming of Jesus so many years ago. So yes, we still are in the last times, but Jesus came and he inaugurated, he began the last times, when he came and he died and he rose again. So uh, Peter says that Jesus was made manifest for the sake of you who are believers. Jesus came, he died, and he rose again for the sake of you who are believers. The very appearance of Jesus to save us from sin is, of course, a good thing. But the resurrection of Jesus is so important because it reminds us of the effectiveness of Jesus' death. I remember from Good Friday, one of the conclusions we came to from God's Word there, from Good Friday, we said the death of Jesus is a ransoming act, freeing us from the penalty of sin. And go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. When the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, the precious blood of Christ is this ransoming work So the ransoming blood of Jesus frees us from the penalty of sin. But the Word of God doesn't stop there. The Word of God doesn't tell us simply that Jesus died for our sins and put your hope and faith in the fact that he died for your sins. Yes, put your faith in the fact that he died for you, but put your faith in the fact that he rose for you as well because the resurrection is the proof and the demonstration that what Jesus did on the cross is actually effective in your life. To put it another way, if you had to go in for some kind of surgery, and can you imagine going into the pre-op with the surgeon, 
and you're sitting down on the table and the surgeon, the doctor comes in and he tells you, hey, I heard you have to have heart surgery and I'm the, I'm the guy who's going to come and do it. I just want you to know that you're the very first heart surgery I've ever done. I've only watched a few in the past and I've never actually done it before, but I want you to know that I've read about it a lot in books and I've done a lot of training on cadavers and dummies and things like that. So don't worry, you're in good hands. Now you're going to be the first successful surgery that I do. How much trust, how much belief would you have in that surgeon? Would you say to that surgeon, my life is in your hands? Probably not. Maybe some of you are very trusting would. It was the last resort, maybe. But I can imagine most of us would want a surgeon who's been tested, who's been tried, a surgeon who has you in the pre-op and says, I've done this a thousand times. I've never lost anyone on the table before. I know exactly what I'm doing. I know exactly how I'm going to go in. And I know exactly how you're going to be healed through this. That's what the resurrection does for you, believer. The resurrection is Jesus coming not in pre-op, but post-op saying, it was completely perfect. I did the job perfectly. And there's nothing you have to worry about. Because see, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we might have fear and doubt to wonder, well, maybe his death on the cross doesn't actually release me from sin. After all, if he couldn't rise from the dead, if he didn't actually have power over death, maybe the consequences of sin will still be true in my life. Maybe that power of sin will still grip me since Jesus wasn't able to overcome it in the grave. I see, the resurrection proves to us, it demonstrates to us, just like a good surgeon is able to demonstrate, he did the job effectively, perfectly. Therefore, God has not rejected you. I see, here's the point. The resurrection reminds us, because Jesus did what he came to do and he died for your sins, that hostile dividing wall that was between you and me and God has been broken down now. The death of Jesus covers sin. It's a penalty that was paid on your behalf, on my behalf, that we couldn't pay for ourselves. And the reason we know that that penalty was completely paid for and that the power of sin no longer holds us and that death is nothing to be feared anymore, the reason we know that's true is because we have a Savior who rose from the dead. That means when we stand before God one day, the very resurrected Jesus will be there on his throne and he will be saying, this one belongs to me. He belongs to us. He's not someone we're rejecting. The power of sin can't hold him or her because I've risen from the dead. I've had victory over sin and death. So the resurrection demonstrates that the death of Jesus really was effective and that God has been successful in bringing sinners back to himself. You are not rejected by God. So many people, though, I fear in our world, they expect acceptance by God to be found in Oh, so many places other than Jesus' death and resurrection. They're looking for acceptance. Acceptance from people. Acceptance from organizations, churches. Acceptance from God. And I fear if, if you're pursuing that acceptance from God in any way other than the cross and the resurrection of Jesus... You will never find the acceptance you so long for and desire. Acceptance from God comes through the work of Jesus. Nothing you do, it's not something you can earn, it's not something you can buy or purchase yourself. This is what we mean by grace, that God has freely given you salvation. That his death on the cross is something that can be freely received. So look to the resurrection as proof that God has not rejected you, that he has in fact accepted those who believe in him, and he'll never reject you then. So the resurrection does away with the fear of rejection, the threat of rejection overcome by the resurrection. Secondly, though, the resurrection overcomes the threat of physical death or even physical harm. Even though you might be harmed in this life, even though you might die, Biologically, physically in this life, 
The permanence of death will not persist because of the resurrection of Jesus. Therefore, the Christian doesn't have to fear the very threat of death. So look what it says in verse 21. It says in verse 21, who through him are believers in God and that God raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in him. Let me say that phrase again. God raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. The resurrection of Jesus is meant to bolster and build faith and hope in God. Well, faith, faith is trust. Trust and assurance that, that God is able to accomplish what he's promised. To have faith and trust in God is to believe that God promised to forgive us from sin on the basis of Christ's death, and he'll do that. I believe and I trust that the work of Jesus actually forgives me from sin. And then I have hope. I have this confidence that God will not abandon me, but will give me eternal life. So the resurrection overcomes the threat of this physical looming death over our lives. See, the desire that the human heart has to persist and endure even past death, I think is a desire that God has built us innately with. This desire that we would not taste death, or that if we do taste death, it will not persist forever. That God will resurrect us and will live with Him forever. And the Word of God tells us such, that all people will endure forever. Some will endure into forever punishment, and some will endure into forever blessing, the presence of God. So the resurrection overcomes this threat of death. We have faith that the work of God is true, what he's accomplished on the cross is true, and we have hope that he will not abandon our life. So faith and hope is this remedy for the fear of death, this eternal separation from God. Because you see, what Christ came to do when he died on the cross, it wasn't just this mystical thing that symbolically washes away symbolic dirt from your life. When Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins, what he was doing was he was breaking down this wall of hostility that exists between us and God. And it exists not because God put it there. It exists not because God wants it there. It exists because of our sin. Going all the way back to the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve first sinned and they ate of the fruit and they disobeyed God and they rebelled against him, the word of God said, through that sin, sin entered and death entered to all of us. And because we all come from Adam and Eve, we all have this sin problem. Again, God didn't want it there. It wasn't there because God put it there. It was there because we sinned before God and this hostility and this wrath that now we should incur, this punishment that we should incur, is now before us. But when Jesus dies on the cross for our sins, he literally, and not figuratively, not symbolically, it wasn't this mystical act of love, and now we're supposed to all hold hands and sing kumbaya and just love the fact that Jesus is an example of love for us. No, when he died on the cross, it was this literal cleansing and cleaning of your life and my life, it was the breaking down of this hostile wall between us and God because the very wrath of God, the very punishment of God, which was supposed to fall upon me and supposed to fall upon you, fell upon Jesus. So the literal, literal wrath and the literal punishment, the literal consequences for sin were consumed by Jesus on the cross and his resurrection proves that that cross was effective. So then death that is supposed to come for us Punishment that is supposed to come for us, separation from God eternally, which is supposed to come for us, does not come for us anymore. For those who know Christ, since God raised Jesus from the dead, he's able to save us from sin and secure an eternal home for us with him in heaven or paradise or the kingdom of God as different texts in the word of God describe this place of eternity with God. Because he can overcome death with Jesus, he can overcome death with us. So have faith and hope in God to dispel this fear of death. And again, as with the first point, there is only one place to find this hope for life after death, to endure through death. 
That hope, of course, is in Jesus. But again, as I kind of survey what goes on in the world around us, and then I take stock of what's in my own heart, and I, and I notice certain temptations that tend to crop up, and I'm aware of this feeling of fear of death, and I wonder, well, where does that fear of death come from? Well, from the threat that possibly I might be separated from God. And then what might I do once I realize that that threat of death, even if I don't believe in God, even if I don't believe in an afterlife, what might I do once I realize that there's a threat of death? One day I'm going to die. What do I do with that threat looming over me? I remember once I was out camping way up north, uh, so far, of course, that we had no cell phone service, and there were no towns for, for over 100 kilometers. And so it's not like you could just kind of up and just jump over and hitchhike somewhere. I remember waking up one morning to the sound of a bear circling my tent, and, and fear gripped me. But it was a very specific kind of fear. It was a kind of fear that told me not only is there a threat circling your tent, there's actually nothing you can do about it. Right? Like, there are some times when a fearful thing comes, a threatening thing comes, and you maybe feel some initial fear, but then you realize, oh, I can do something about this. Like you're driving along the highway, and you see some deer bounding across the field, and you think to yourself, oh, no, I don't want to run into one of those. If I do, it's going to total my vehicle. So you put on the brakes, and you stop, and you realize, okay, I can do something about that. But there's a bear circling your tent. You're kind of like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do about that threat. Because if I stay quiet, the bear might still come in and do something to me. If I make noise, it might make him angry, and he could still come in and do something to me. There is nothing I can actually do for this threat. And I believe that when people realize that the looming threat of death, ultimately, you can't do anything about that. There's this claustrophobia of fear that tends to grip us, and people will do all sorts of things to be relieved of it. Sometimes they'll just try to escape, like escapism. Just try, don't think about it. it just, just turn my mind to other things. Be hyper-focused on tasks around me and on maybe my family or, or other good things in my life. And I'm just not going to think about death. I know it's out there. I know it's looming, but why think about it? It's coming for everybody, and I know there's nothing I can do about it, so I'm just not going to think about it. There's Josh wrapped up in his sleeping bag with a bear circling his tent. I'm just not going to think about it. Just close my eyes, go right back to sleep again. And hopefully I wake up again another day. That's escapism. And so many people in our, in our world, when it comes to the threat of death, they try to escape it in all sorts of those means. Hedonistic means, wealth, fame, power. They, they maybe try to avoid all threats of danger and risk to life because they don't want their life to be uh, cut short in some way. They live their life in a bubble. Or maybe you're like this other kind of person who, who tries to escape the looming threat of death with a legacy. I'm just going to try to live my life so impressively, and maybe I won't remain personally as a human, but my legacy will remain. And that's what I want to happen. I want people to remember me. I want to do something so impressive that the glory of my accomplishments will last forever. That maybe one day someone will put a statue of me up and they'll remember Josh did something. And I can sleep at night knowing that I might die one day, but at least people will remember me. See, some people want to escape the threat of death through building some kind of legacy. And maybe they go out and they do all sorts of good deeds and charitable works and things like this because they want to be remembered. Or back in the ancient world, they go to war and they want to conquer everything and everyone and show their prowess on the on the military field of battle so that they can achieve glory, so that people remember them for who they were. And then still others turn to other things, even less impressive things, like science. Maybe they turn to things like the science of longevity, agelessness. What things can science give me that will extend my life just a little bit longer? I just need a little bit more, a little bit more time. Maybe cloning is going to be the answer. Uh, maybe medicine. Maybe AI. Maybe I can plant my consciousness into some robot one day and I can just live forever. You know there's celebrities out there who, who have 
frozen themselves because they're hoping that one day they'll be able to be unfrozen and resurrected in some AI robot of some kind or cloned. They're hoping science has the answer. It's going gonna, it's gonna to relieve me from the threat of death. It will not. Neither science nor legacy nor escapism can relieve you from the threat of death. The only way for your life to endure is in Christ. The only way for your life to endure in the kingdom of God is through Christ. The resurrection, what we celebrate on Easter Sunday, the resurrection proves to us, it reminds us that there is a way to endure past this horror that we know of death. Because one man was able to do it. The God-man was able to do it. And he's told us, he's promised us that if we have faith in him, he'll also give that same power to us. This resurrecting power by God's grace. So the only way for you to endure in life is to look to the resurrection, to believe in Christ. So the resurrection, again, is the remedy for this fear, the fear of death or even physical harm. And then lastly, the resurrection overcomes the threat, the fear of insignificance, meaninglessness. Now, if you don't struggle with the fear of rejection and you don't struggle with the fear of impending death, maybe you've just put it out of your mind, our world, I think, really does struggle with this one the most. Fear of insignificance. And you might think to yourself, oh, that's not a big deal. I got that one covered. Do you? I want you to think about this. Significance. Why do you get up every single morning? Why do you get out of bed is maybe the better question. Why do you get out of bed every single morning? The only reason you get out of bed every single morning is because you believe there is some significant, meaningful reason for you to do so. If you did not believe there was a significant, meaningful reason for you to do so, all some pretty horrific consequences follow, don't they? We see them all over the news and we see them in the world today. The threat of insignificance is the greatest threat, I believe, a humanity perceives in their world and in their life. To put it in the positive, it's the desire to have a meaningful life. I want a meaningful life. I don't just want to live and drift into this world of mediocrity. I do want to be noticed. I do want to be seen. I want to be accepted by people and accepted by my God. And I want to be able to overcome this impending doom of death. Oh, but death's way out there. It's so far away and it doesn't have anything to do with me today. But what does have something to do with me today is the significance and meaning of life that I so long for. I don't just want to go through life invisible. I want to have purpose. I want to have meaning. I want to be able to do something of value in this life. The resurrection does that for us too. The resurrection overcomes the threat of insignificance and meaninglessness. Look what it says in verse 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for its sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. And let's begin with that second verse. Since you have been born again. That phrase that Peter uses, born again, is alluding to the same thing that just happened in the life of Jesus. His life was born again. He literally came alive in the tomb. And he's saying this born again, this new life, is a life that a Christian can have. And he says, you're born again, you have this resurrected life, not because of something you do, not because of some incantation or mystical spell or formula that you walk through in life, you are born again by this imperishable seed that's called the Word of God. The very breath of God, the life of God, the Spirit of God brings you life, transforms you, resurrects you to faith, love, and obedience. So since you've been born again by God's Word, God brings you new life, transformed life, the resurrection of Jesus 
is this foretaste, just as we sang in and come behold the wondrous mystery, that last verse. What a foretaste of deliverance. The resurrection of Jesus reminds us that there is this foretaste of deliverance that we experience now that will one day be experienced to its fullest. You're born again to new life. That means your life now has new meaning. It has new purpose. It has a new kind of value. Oh, God values all people. God values all of his children But when you come to know him personally and you come to have faith and trust in him and believe that the resurrection of Jesus means you have new life as well, you have new purpose and new meaning and God infuses your life with this new kind of value because now you're able to live for the things that God has designed and created you for. So then in verse 22, he says, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, For a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly. Obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. What is this new life meant to look like? What is this new purpose and this new significance that you have? Obedience to the truth is your purpose, your meaning, your significance. What is the truth? Jesus said it best, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Obedience to the truth is the same as saying obedience to Jesus himself. How do you know what Jesus is calling you to, what he wants for you? How do you know how to be obedient to Jesus? Find him in his word. Obedience to the truth is the same as saying obedience to Jesus, which is the same as saying obedience to the word of God, the Bible. So you are called to the significant, meaningful life of obedience to Christ. And that obedience to Christ is summed up and it's expressed, as Peter says here, as brotherly love towards one another. Love for, for one another. He says love that comes from a pure heart, that is a heart that's sincere. I'm, I'm obedient to Christ. This is my new life. This is my new significance. And it's manifest in this love towards one another. Love that is not just me trying to play a game. Not obligation, not manipulation. Sincere, from a pure heart, loving one another just as Christ loved us. I'm not playing a game. I'm not thinking to myself, I wonder what I can get from them. I wonder how I can manipulate them. I wonder how I can get them to do what I want. Well, I know I'll love them. I'll do things for them. I'll be kind to them. And then they'll respond to me the way I want them to. That's not a game. It's not a mere obligation. The kind of love that God wants for you, the kind of love that Peter says is this new, significant, meaningful life, is, is love that comes from a pure heart, a sincere heart, a heart that reflects the heart of Christ. He did not go to the cross for his own gain. He went to the cross for your gain. And so that you would have eternal life, so that I would have eternal life. So the resurrection reminds us that God has this incredible purpose for your life, for you to be living right now. Yes, there's a new life that waits for us in the future, and the fear of death is overcome, and we look forward to that new life we have one day, but the resurrection also reminds us of the new incredible purpose that God has for your life right now, meaning there is no fear of insignificance for the Christian Because the threat of insignificance has been defeated. No matter who you are, if you have faith in Christ, you've been given new life. No matter what station of life you're in, no matter how old you are or how young you are, no matter what job you have, no matter how big or small your family is, no matter how great your responsibilities are that God's given you, or how small in comparison to others your responsibilities are. It doesn't matter if you're an adult with all sorts of stressors and anxieties and things in your life that you have to take care of, or if you're just a young child who wakes up and thinks, oh, it's Easter morning. I wonder where all my eggs are hidden. It doesn't matter who you are. If you know Christ, you have new, significant, meaningful life. Do you hear that, children? Young people? Teenagers? It doesn't matter who you are. You have meaningful significant life in Christ. Do you hear that, parent? It doesn't matter what you're going through right now. You might be weighted down by the burden of parenting and anxiousness about what's going on in your kids' lives. 
and the world around you, you have meaningful life to be living. Life in obedience to the truth. Life in love towards others. A life given away for others. If you're a student, if you're a parent, if you're a retiree, if you're in the middle of some massive work project, if you're a farmer, if you've got a lot to do right now and you know you've got to get out into the fields, if you're wondering what the harvest is going to look like later, you have a significant, meaningful life. It's not wrapped up in your family. It's not wrapped up in your job. It's not wrapped up in your reputation. It's not wrapped up in your personal significance. It's wrapped up in the significance of the new life God has given you through the resurrection. While so many people look for the significance of life in all the wrong places, they look for significance and they look for the reciprocation of significance in relationships. Our relationships are good. Marriages are good. They're for the blessing of the people involved in them from God. But if you're looking for your meaning and your significance in your relationship, you are going to be sorely disappointed. And that significance is, and that meaning is always going to come up short. It's never going to fill the desire of your heart. So many people look for significance and meaning in their workplace, in their vocation, and what they do for a living. They believe, since I can put bread on the table, since I can put money in the bank, that makes me a significant, valuable person in this society. Your significance is not found in your workplace. If that's where you're looking for it, again, you will always come up short. You'll always be looking for something new. You'll always be looking to go to that next place. Oh, where's my next promotion? Where's my next work going to be? Oh, they don't really value me here anymore, so I'm going to go somewhere else. Oh, this isn't really scratching the itch I really wanted out of life, so I'm going to go look for a new job, a new place, a new thing that's going to bring me meaning. So many people look for meaning in their workplaces. Others look for it in adventures and experiences. I don't really feel meaningful or, or valued or significant right now, but if I could just go travel, that's what would do it for me. I just need to see the world. I just got to get out there and see things. And that's going to bring me some significance or meaning in life. Or, or high adrenaline experiences. I'm going to go bungee jumping. I'm going to go skydiving. I want to do all these crazy, outrageous things because I want to feel alive. I need these experiences. I want these experiences. Those adventures, those experiences do not bring meaning. Others then will look for it in wealth, power, reputation. All of this to say there was one man who lived many, many years ago. And he said all of it's meaningless. It's chasing after the wind. The end of life, to do good in life, is to obey God. Serve Him with your heart. All of these things fail to bring a person true meaning. And in the resurrection, though, we see a living Savior who calls us to a new, a truly new way of living for Him. So find your significance in Christ. Live in obedience and love towards Him, towards others. So then, church, this Easter Sunday, my hope is that we'll have seen and believed that the resurrection of Jesus is the thing. It's the event that we look to for all of our fears to be quelled and dispelled. I'll ask you again, what brings you fear? Maybe fear of rejection, fear of insignificance, fear of death. Look to the empty tomb. Believe that Christ has risen and that God has brought you salvation, which means no rejection. No insignificance, no death. He has accepted you, prepared an eternal home for you, and given you the greatest meaning and purpose you could have. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us to believe this, especially today. Believe that you're alive. Believe that you've overcome the grave and given us new life as well. Father, this is the greatest meaning and purpose that we could have. And by your resurrection, you have dispelled and done away with all of these great fears. All oh, so many people in our world, and, and we felt the temptation as well, Father, to be fearful and anxious over these things that we cannot control. But through the resurrection, you have defeated them. 
You have defeated the fear of rejection. You have defeated the fear of insignificance, and you have defeated the fear of ultimate death and separation from you. So, Father, thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for Jesus, for it's in his name we pray these things. Amen. Uh, we invite you to stand with us as we sing in closing, Our God Reigns. Heavenly Father, Lord, we again thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you that you are alive, that you are reigning and, and ruling over all things, even today. And we thank you that you are risen, and we celebrate that risen, uh, the resurrection, Lord, the fact that you are risen. Father, help us to believe and trust that you're seated on the throne and that all of our fears can be answered within that great event, that act of the resurrection. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless.